So as I mentioned in the last video, right, that preferred mineral orientation can develop, right, either with pressure solution or with plastic deformation, but it can also happen with shear rotation, which means, as you see in this box here, I'm going to take this mineral or this rock and I'm going to pull part of it this way and part of it this way, which of course causes that what was in the center, right, as you can see here, to rotate and all these minerals start lining up parallel. Whereas with plastic deformation here with this flattening, they're lining up perpendicular. We also have to remember that hot water is always going to be working through this system. We call that hydrothermal metamorphism, right? Hot water. Of course, this is going to help uh, facilitate chemical reactions. It can add or subtract elements as well. And this is also how we get um, veins of minerals to form um, as hot water is working through the system and it starts to dissolve minerals and deposit minerals. So we're going to see that we have two different types of metamorphic rocks, the ones that have preferred orientation and the ones that don't. So our first division is our foliated metamorphic rock. These are the ones that are definitely pressure di driven and they experience that differential stress so they are going to be foliated. And the other group are our non-foliated metamorphic rocks. These are the ones that experience temperature more than pressure. So if you take a look here, notice that these minerals are just all over the place in this marble. They're not all lined up with each other. So let's take a look at each of these. So we'll start out with our foliated metamorphic rocks, which of course, like we said, you're gonna see that preferred mineral orientation. And in some of our higher levels, we're going to see compositional banding, where our mafic minerals separate, separate away from our felsic minerals. So at our lowest pressure range, we have slate. So slate starts out its life as a shale, okay, which is basically a fine-grained clay or mud. And as it undergoes pressure changes, um, as you can see, it's going to flatten this, this rock out here. And it's going to create these really fine layers right, due to that preferred mineral orientation, we call that foliation. And what's really neat about slate is it can break apart along those foliation planes. It's very reminiscent of mineral cleavage, but as you can see here, this guy is just making uh, slate roofing tiles, and all he's basically doing is just hitting the rock, and it'll break apart into those nice flat layers. Um, so when you look at slate roofing tiles or a um, chalkboard, they're flat because that's how the mineral forms, right, due to that foliation. Now, if I take that slate and expose it to slightly higher pressures, it's going to turn into phyllite. Phyllite, as you can see in this picture, is wavy, so it has a little bit wavier texture, whereas slate is flat. But because we're at this slightly higher temperature range, we're going to start to form our micas, which, remember, micas are minerals that can pull apart into sheets. Now, the pressure isn't high enough, for big sheets of mica to form at this range, but we start to see very small micas. And that's what gives this this shiny look. We call that phyllitic luster. Um, so sometimes it's really hard to tell phyllite apart from slate. However, phyllite is very shiny, so that's gonna be one very easy way to tell it apart. At this range, if I had started out with a much larger rock, um, instead of say clay or mud, if I started out with a gravel, right, nice big round pieces, you can see at this point with differential stress, they have definitely now become very inequant, and we call this metaconglomerate. So if you remember that picture we looked at earlier where we had those round grains and they were squashed, you could tell they were squashed. I mean, if you look in here, you can see all those rings, right? It's very obvious that this is a rock that has undergone differential stress. Now, if I take that phyllite and continue to squash it, it's going to form a rock we call schist. Schist has visible micas in it. So if you take a look at this picture, you can see all those larger uh, mica grains that are in here. We call that schistosity when you can see those large mica grains. And it's also very common for our schist uh, to have garnets in them as well at this much higher pressure range. And then finally, when, I, when this rock experiences the highest pressure, it's going to turn into what we call a gneiss. And a gneiss has compositional banding, which means, if I draw a little tiny version of Bowen's in here, 
we are now getting close to that bottom part of Bowens. So we're now getting close to where the felsic minerals essentially want to begin melting. So because we're getting close to their melting point, the mafic minerals and the felsic minerals start to separate away from each other. So they become segregated. And what's really neat is you can really see the plastic deformation in this rock. I see how, how bent that it is. I'm showing you that we're also at a very high temperature range as well as pressure. So that compositional banding um, that we just saw can develop in a couple of different ways. First of all, if you have a rock that already starts out as layered, well, that's going to be pretty easy that it's going to end up as layered. Um, but if we have very high temperature and shearing, right, which you see over here in this picture on the left, that can cause that compositional banding. But by far, what's really common is this differentiation where our minerals separate away from each other. This word differentiation just means separation due to density. So those mafic minerals and those felsic minerals start to split out from each other. And it's very easy to see. Uh, it's very easy to recognize the nice, but you kind of have that zebra look to it. Now, if we took that nice and continued to expose it to higher pressures and temperatures, what would actually happen is our felsic minerals would begin to melt, as you can see in this picture down here. So you can definitely see you've got mafic bands and felsic bands, and then you've got this giant blobby looking band in here. So it's very clear that this felsic material began, that it melted. So that tells me that you know, if we're looking at Bowen's, we've surpassed this 600 degree range, right? So my felsic material started to melt. So this rock is what we call a migmatite. A migmatite is literally half igneous and half metamorphic. Um, because there is some melt that formed in there to make that mineral. So um, if we continued uh, to bury this rock and expose it to higher temperatures, of course, everything would melt. Now, if we take a look at our non-foliated metamorphic rocks, these do not have that preferred orientation to it at all. There's no differential stress. These rocks are experiencing essentially the effects of temperature changes, not pressure changes. So our first group we can look at are our hornfells. Hornfells are essentially any rock that's going to experience um, heating due to an igneous intrusion. So here, if I have an igneous intrusion sitting below the ground, obviously it's hot. And as it gives off heat, it might not be enough heat to melt the rock around it, but it could be enough to metamorphose the rock. So basically, this rock is just going to get baked for a very long time and it forms this rock we call a horn fell. Another type of common non-foliated metamorphic rock is amphibolite. Amphibolite is where we start out with basalt or gabbro as our protolith, and it gets baked over time, and it turns into amphibolite. As you can see, it's not very well foliated, but you can see some of the effects of that plastic deformation in there. Then we can also have a quartzite. A quartzite is a rock that starts off its life as a sandstone. This sandstone gets baked, and essentially these uh, grains of sand get welded to each other, and it turns into this rock called a quartzite. And if you take a look at the quartzite, you can still see that there's a sandy texture in there. And if you were to feel it, it would still feel fairly sandy as well. And then finally, we have a marble. Um, marbles start out their life as this rock over here. This is limestone. Limestone, as you'll learn more about it when we get to the sedimentary chapter, um, forms in a coral reef environment, so it forms in a very specific environmental zone, but it's formed with the mineral calcite. If we take limestone and expose it to high temperatures, it turns into this rock we call marble. Marble is also composed of calcite. It's just microcrystalline as limestone, and the, and the temperature helps it grow to larger crystal sizes that we call marble, um, which, of course, because they're both made of calcite, they both pass the hydrochloric acid test, where I could drop it on either one of these, and they would fizz. So it's really kind of interesting when you start looking at these statues, right, that we see all over um, carved up of, of marble. Remember that they started their life hundreds of millions of years ago underneath the ocean in a coral reef environment.